Um, my name is Mark Hart. I run System Basketball Guys, and tonight we have Brent Tipton of the Guam Federation, and he is going to, he's kind of doing a second part for you guys. Um, he did an overview of two-sided transition. Tonight, he's going to do more drills and show you how he teaches it. So, Brent, I'm here to assist you. Anything I can help you do, I appreciate you coming on again, and, and I know you're going to kill it, so... Thank you, Mark. Um, so some of my expectation for this one is uh, we're going to spend about 15 minutes reviewing what we went over last time, uh, but we're going to hit some of the points a little bit differently just on the last two months of me continually studying this topic. Uh, and then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the responsibilities of each individual player uh, in two side transition. And then the last 20 minutes, uh, we're going to be spending, we're going to go through our core drills. So I'll explain what that all, what, what that looks like as we go through. Um, and then before we go any farther, um, I gave a plug out to Chris Oliver and basketball immersion uh, on the two side. So you, as you guys have obviously know, two side is something that basketball immersion has pushed as their primary transition. So a lot of my own learning has come from them. So you can take what I say and then match it with what they say. Some of it similar, similar, some of it may be a little bit different, but I just want to put that plug in there as well. Our agenda is to review our last session, and then we're going to talk through player responsibilities. Then we're going to hammer out the priorities of what we do in the two side uh, with the uh, point guard decision making. And then we're going to show the core drills of how we teach and load the two side. And then these are some of the teams that we're going to be studying. And it's the same exact teams that we were studying last time. So uh, in our last webinar, we discussed impacting pace with two-side transition. We talked specifically why play with pace, how the two-side impacts pace, and then we briefly got into teaching the two-side. So we're going to go through that here in the next 15 minutes just so we can refresh. Then I want to uh, point out some uh, more points on uh, how we can go about with these three topics. So the first thing that we argued why play with pace is earlier shots in transition hold greater value. So we want to score within the first eight, uh, six to eight seconds of the shot clock by creating a big advantage shot. Now this doesn't mean that we're going to shoot any shot within the first six to eight seconds, but we are sprinting to create big advantage shots. So here is a diagram that we give our players on what a small advantage shot versus a big advantage shot looks like. So small advantage shots on the catch, the defender is closer than arm's length distance, and it's more likely against a short closeout. So the, the shot selection criteria for, for a small advantage shot means that it was contested, it's unbalanced, it's not in range, and it's not in rhythm. So we talk about their first touch decision could have been to pass it or even to drive it, but not to shoot it. Big advantage shots, on the other hand, are on the catch. The defender is farther than arm's length distance on the catch. Their, their closeout may be a long closeout. So their shot selection criteria means that the shot is not contested. It's on balance. It's in range. It's in rhythm. And their first touch decision is to shoot it. So a great acronym that I've stolen just in the last month from Mike de Craker from uh, Elite Athletes in Belgium after we, after we talked through this, he gave me the Rob Shots acronym. Uh, so this is uh, the Rob Shot acronym basically means that Rob Shots are in range, open because they're uncontested and on balance. If a player has a big advantage shot that is in range, open and on balance and in the rhythm of our offensive pace, we want them to shoot this shot within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. And all of our Rob shots, we want them to be key three or free. So we're trying to play paint to great by getting the key. We're trying to get uncontested stationary catch and shoot shots from three or the free part, we're trying to get fouled in the process. So what does a big advantage shot look like? This is an example of a big advantage three. And we want our players to sprint in transition to score, not to run the floor to run a set. We want them to use the two side spacing template to create a numerical advantage. And we want to shoot the first big advantage shot within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. Why? We feel like earlier shots in transition hold greater value. 
And we're going to see more data on that in the next point. So rewinding this here, here, here the pass is going to go early and up, up the same sideline as the outlet to the single side. And on the catch, this player's, uh, this player's defender is stuck with a long closeout. This catch right here is an example of a first touch decision that we're, we're showing our players on film. He either has the choice to shoot it, drive it, move it. The first touch decision here would be a catch and shoot because his defender is farther than arm's length distance on the catch. And this is an example of a big advantage shot. And we're going to shoot this shot on a hit ahead in transition within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. And we have the mindset that you are never more open than when you first catch the ball. So the question would be, well, how do players know when they're open when they first catch the ball? Well, going back to when we get this outlet, coming, coming down to point guard decision making, we're always wanting to go early and opposite. And we're going to show why we want to do that later. We always want to go opposite of the uh, outlet. This, in this case, it would be to the two side. But as the point guard is dribble pushing, he is reading the hit ahead uh, of the single side who is uh, one pass away or this early and up pass. If this defender is inside the three-point line, then that would be a decision for the point guard to hit ahead early and up. Now, rewind it just a bit back here. If this defender who was here, you can't see him on the screen, but if this defender was outside the three-point line, then we would want to play early and opposite to the, to the opposite two side or playing early through our trail. So this is what an example of a big advantage shot would look like. This is an example of a small advantage shot. So here we're going to see in transition a neutral advantage. So five defenders are back and we're going to see an early and drag with the trail. And this is one of our triggers when all five defenders are back. Notice that after the switch, the gravity that Eric Gordon has on the, uh, on the 45 here. So after the switch and as Rivers punches the paint, we call all of our penetration punch, he is going to spray it to the 45 here to the 45 where McLemore catches. And this is an example of a small advantage shot. His defender is closer than arm's length distance, actually has a hand up in the shot pocket, and it, but he still takes this shot. So we would define this shot as a small advantage shot. So it's not a rob shot. It may be in McLemore's range, but it is contested. And then it's off balance. This pass is a, actually a bounce pass almost right to his knees. So we would clarify this as a small advantage shot. Now we have rules that we've stolen from the dominoes concept where, where two, uh, one defender cannot guard two. So that's a common rule within dominoes, but I want to add to that rule and show you an example of how we add to that rule. Not only do we have uh, the rule that we don't want one defender to guard two, but we also have the rule that we don't want my defender to help on penetration and close me out. So that would also lead to this shot being a small advantage shot. If it's a small advantage shot, we either want to move it or we want to drive it so that we can get uh, defense and dominoes and attack that, that short close out here that led to a small advantage shot. So why do shots or why do shots earlier in transition hold greater value? I went to um, nbastats.com and I pulled these stats from nbastats.com, uh, the advanced stats. And these statistics are the reason why we're trying to generate shots within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. We're trying to hunt these big advantage shots earlier shots in transition have greater value. In the first eight seconds of the shot clock, Houston is shooting 53.7%. We call this phase one of the shot clock. In, their, uh, in every three to four seconds on the shot clock, as the shot clock's ticking down, their shooting percentage drastically drops from 57.8% in the first two seconds of the shot clock down to 38.5. And so we see these shooting percentages as if we can create big advantage shots in phase one, first eight seconds of the shot clock, our shots have greater value. If we get to phase two, where, the Houston, where Houston is shooting 45.1%, we are using small advantages or triggers, whether that's space, whether that's a, a DHO or a, a get or a mid pick and roll, we're using those small advantages to, to create big advantage shots. 
And then as we get to the last eight seconds of our shot clock, what we call phase three, if we haven't got a small advantage that leads to a big advantage, then we're going to have to settle for a best expected value shot. Those can either be uh, long uh, or um, contested shots or uh, long twos. So these are the reasons why uh, going from 53.7% all the way down to 38.1% at the end of the shot clock, why we feel earlier shots in transition hold, great, uh, hold, uh, hold more value. So the second thing that we talked about and why play with pace in transition was we want to create numerical advantages and cross matches. So we're not going to show any film on this, but we're going to talk about how the mark of great transition team is how many numerical advantages they create and leverage during the course of a game as a result of their pace. Now, realistically, this, these numerical advantages look like five on threes or four on twos or five on fours with trailing defenders. Two side transition is the spacing template that you need to create these numerical advantages that are gonna lead to a big advantage shot. So we always say sprinting leads to big advantage. Running or jogging leads to a small advantage and we're constantly coaching our players to sprint. The last thing here when we're creating a numerical advantage or a cross match is the question, is the question of do, does your transition pace create cross match situations where defense must forget about locating their uh, locating and guarding their assigned man, but because you transition with pace, they just have to take the closest man. So this is going to create advantages through cross match of either a big on small or a small on big. And we look to leverage these advantages within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. And then the last thing that we talked about when we why play with pace and transition, and this is specifically for us, we want to mask our lack of size. Or in your case, if you have a great athletic team, then I feel like the two side is going to enhance um, your athletic ability. So we want our um, transition to be posi positionless to a five out spacing template. And this gives us more opportunity to use small advantages in space that lead to big advantage shots in space. So a phrase that we say is that we wanna play paint to great in the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. So playing paint to great means that if we have not created a big advantage catch and shoot shot on a hit ahead, we want to attack the first closeout to get one paint touch within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. And that paint touch, we want it to become either a, a key three or free shot. Um, and if a player cannot catch and shoot on a hit ahead, then we want his first touch decision to drive it. So here we're gonna see an example of what it looks like to play for us paint to great. Here we're gonna see Westbrook be, grab the rebound and become his own outlet, which is a point that we're gonna make in our responsibilities. So we have the two side up the right sideline and we have the single side up the left sideline. Westbrook's initial punch is gonna open up, uh, sorry, um, Westbrook's initial punch opens up a spray to the two side corner and this leads to a small advantage on the catch. A small advantage is gonna um, uh, be different for certain players. Some players are gonna need a larger passing window to shoot their shot. And that would be the same case here for PJ Tucker. This could be a big advantage for McLemore, but for PJ Tucker, this becomes a small advantage. We always wanna attack bad closeouts. And here LeBron is given a straight driving line to the paint. And we call this, what PJ, when PJ uh, Tucker gets on his driving line, we call this a punch and spray. So we're playing paint to great with the paint touch and the penetrator is spraying the pass to the opposite two side for a two on one offensive advantage where we have stretch spacing, where we stretch this got to defender. And this leads to a great big advantage catch and shoot three. Now, when playing paint to great, the reason why we want to play paint to great, we ensure that we aggressively test defensive rotations and communication early in the possession. And any incorrect rotation and lack of communication exposes the transition defense to dominoes and dominoes is needed to create and leverage big advantage shots. And we feel that playing paint to great best mask our lack of size. So how does a two-side impact playing with pace? 
we're going to talk about two things with corner spacing, and then we're going to get into uh, teaching the two side. So how does the two, two side impact playing with pace? The biggest thing that we talked about here was corner spacing. Liam Flynn says the statement, space before advantage, advantage before shot. Chris Oliver says spacing makes things simple in a complex setting. Kobe Carl also says simplicity and space create creativity and beauty in the unpredictability of randomness. And this is exactly what corner spacing and spacing within the two side gives us. So having two side spacing stretches rotations uh, of transition defense where the farthest defender from the ball usually gets caught guarding two offensive players on the two side. This is because the transition defense's tendencies, which we're gonna discuss when we teach going early and opposite. Lastly, the two side impacts playing with pace because the two side is a modern spacing template that maximizes force space by flattening the defense with its corner spacing. Two side spacing template is an excellent spacing template to create long closeouts for shot drive decisions that lead to big advantage shots within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. So why does it impact pace? We create two on ones on the two side and we're gonna see how it creates two separate closeouts for these big advantage shots. So what is corner spacing? Corner spacing is at the point of the defensive rebound the first players down the court are going to fill the nearest sideline and sprint to fill the corners first. As these players fill the corners, they will arrive at rim level to provide width and depth for the ball. And here we say that, see the first players down after hugging the nearest sideline arrive into their corner spacing. So this player will arrive into his corner spacing rim level. Now, going back to the question, how many numerical advantages you create in transition determines if you are a great transition team. So here we're going to see a deep outlet and a four on three offensive advantage. So we have a player in the left corner and a four on three offensive advantage. What are our roles for our players when we get to this offensive uh, offense situation of four on three? Are we encouraging them and providing a solution for them to continue leveraging advantage, or are we telling them to hold it back and set it up? And again, we need to teach our players the solutions to continue continuing leveraging this four on three numerical advantage. Two sides gonna leverage this advantage, and then we're gonna get a big advantage shot as a, re, as a result of our corner spacing. So here Harden is gonna go early and opposite of the outlet, and this pass has created a two on one here with the got to defender on the two side. And notice our stretch spacing with the 45 in the corner. This is gonna ensure that one defender cannot guard two on the two side. And again, we want the 45 uh, to delay his fill as he's sprinting from half court and play three point line extended as opposed to free throw line ex extended, which is traditional in, in a numbered break. Here at Ginobili, is gonna get caught guarding two on the two side, and the 45 is gonna make the one more pass to the corner. Ginobili is gonna to commit to the closeout to the corner, so the corner makes a bam bam or a pass pass back to the 45 for a catch and shoot stationary big advantage three from the 45. Now, the reason why I love the bam bam is because a lot of times, this got to defender is going to commit to the closeout in the corner because the corner is the highest percentage shot in the NBA. So he's going to commit himself to that closeout, which when the bam bam comes back to the 45 is create the space before advantage for us to shoot this big advantage shot. In this example, we're going to see how corner spacing is going to create two separate closeouts. So the biggest reason for why corner spacing is Corner spacing and shooting corner threes are utilized by efficient offenses. And the reason is not because the shot is a shorter distance to the rim. In efficient offenses, corner threes are stationary catch and shoot shots because the corner is the last spot left open by transition defense in rotations. So whether these stationary catch and shoot uh, shots are generated by playing paint to great 
uh, from the penetrator or after one Morris by coming early and opposite. Corner spacing is the only way to stretch transition defenses rotations to generate these corner threes. So corner spacing increases the chance of getting a stationary catch and shoot shot attempt. And the reason is because we have space before advantage, advantage before shot. So here we're gonna see the point guard grab the rebound and become his own outlet. And the best way to ignite the two side transition is for the rebounder to become his own outlet and dribble push. This is a five on four offensive advantage and again, the mark of a great transition team is how many numerical advantages they create with their pace and space. Here, the point guard is going to go early and opposite of the outlet to the two side, where we have corner spacing in both corners. Here we have corner spacing uh, eventually in the right corner and corner spacing here in the left corner. Now, notice the stretch spacing between the 45 and the corner, who is the 45 here is three point line extended. The corner is going to four or the, 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 the stretch spacing between the two players on the two side is going to ensure that the got two defender cannot guard the both of them on the two side. So one defender cannot guard two. And here he makes the one more to the corner for a big advantage catch and shoot three. The second thing that corner spacing gives you is not only this two on one offensive advantage, but notice number 20 here have to close out to the corner. So the, the, the got two defender uh, commits to the 45. They make that one more to the corner. And now this closeout is a long closeout coming from the paint. And this is always going to constitute for us a, uh, a big advantage shot. And this is the reason why we're wanting corner spacing in our two side transition. The second thing that we talked about is um, how, the, how the two side impacts place, pace by, or, or um, the two side impacts playing with pace is going early and opposite. Uh, we're gonna discuss this more in detail uh, when we talk about teaching and loading the two side. And then the last thing that we talked about and how does the two side impact playing with pace is that it is scripted to unscripted. So the two side is scripted and that players must sprint to corners first. Then the second player on the two side has to get to the 45. But once we get to our spacing template, we are empowering players to self-regulate to make basketball decisions based upon what the defense gets. I believe that players play at their best when they play freely. So a lot of coaches have primary break that leads to secondary break that leads to their sets, like step on a ladder. We don't want to handicap players' decision-making uh, by dictating where the ball is to be dribbled or where the ball is to be passed. We are constantly moving the ball within our two side spacing template to find a small advantage on the closeout or a trigger that can lead to a big advantage shot. And a lot of what makes playing conceptually in the two side effective is that the offense never stops leveraging for advantage. We teach that when the ball stops, advantage stops. So there is no stop in primary transition and starting our offense. We are continually playing offense by hunting big advantage shots. And as Chris Oliver has said, the two side isn't magical. It is just a spacing template. It becomes magical when players start making great decisions out of the two side. So getting into our teaching progressions, uh, we're gonna first discuss in a lot more detail than we did last time, the two side transition player responsibilities, and then what are our priorities within the two side? The second thing we're gonna dive deeper into is uh, teaching going early and opposite and what every position is doing and going early and opposite. And then we're gonna dive into going early and up. And then in the midst of everything, we're gonna talk about create, how we create a three side and solve this, the, the issue of having a three side. And then also during early and opposite and early and up, what are we doing when we dribble push? And then we're gonna share our two side core drills. So teaching the teaching, uh, progression for the two side. What are our responsibilities for our rebounder or inbounder? And then what is the responsibility of the point guard? So the rebounder or inbounder is always the nearest, um, the rebounder, the inbounder is always the nearest player takes out the ball, whether that is a guard or a big on makes. The rebounder or inbounder always becomes the trail and is gonna fill the dead center spot in transition. The point guard 
we always want him to shorten the pass wherever he is at on the floor with a loop to the nail. And so we want him to stampede his catch, catch the ball already moving downhill, and we want hit aheads over dribbles. And we want our point guard to be a ball mover early with the ball crossing half court by air. So going into our rebounder or our inbounder responsibilities, the rebounder becomes a trail, whether the rebounder is a, a, um, a big or whether the, the rebounder is a guard. So here we're going to see the point guard is stampeding his catch, already moving downhill on the catch of the outlet. Now the outlet area, as we have defined, is the space in between the nail and the top of the three-point line and then free throw line extended to three-point line, all the way from this free throw line extended to three-point line. This is our outlet area that we prefer our point guard to catch. Uh, we don't want to get butt to the sideline and play uh, far away from the sideline, and we're going to talk about why we don't want to do that uh, uh, later on. Here, the point guard, George Hill, is going to dribble push, and the biggest teaching point when we dribble push is push until the defense stops you. And a lot of times this gets us into playing paint to great early on in the shot clock. And we're going to see George Hill sprayed out to the two side corner. Now rewinding back here to our rebounder, Corver is actually our rebounder in this situation. So as a guard, even though he's a guard, he is going to play into the trail position. So he is going to outlet that ball. He's going to play with pace and delay the trail play with pace behind the trail. And as George Hill plays paint to great, we're going to see Corver stop at the dead center spot here at the top of the key and play with, play with space. So after uh, George Hill sprays to the two side corner, we're going to see George, uh, sorry, we're going to see Corver apply stretch spacing with the 45. Corver has tremendous gravity. So we want to make sure that one defender cannot guard both the 45 and Corver here at the top. And we're going to see him play with stretch spacing. It's also because he has this gravity, he is going to pull this player with him. And as that ball goes up to the 45, because of Corver's stretch spacing and his gravity, this opens up a big advantage catch and shoot shot here at the 45. Now, again, we said that the two side creates not only two on one advantages, but it also creates two closeouts. So the two on one advantage would come here as a ball is sprayed to the corner. The two on one advantage is between this defender and these two offensive players. But the second closeout comes here by number 45. This is just an example of a short or soft closeout. And that, that's going to result in a catch and shoot shot. If 45 here, was to, uh, to have a hard closeout, then number seven, Ilyasova would have a drive decision. And then that would get the defense and dominoes. And then we would be playing out of space before advantage and advantage, out of shot, uh, advantage before shot out of that situation. The second point here that I want to make with uh, the rebounder or the inbounder's uh, transition responsibility is how to become your own outlet. So if the rebounder is the point guard, or we are comfortable with them with a dribble push in transition, we let them become their own outlet. So a teaching point here is if this rebounder were to rebound with his chest to the baseline or his back to the rim, then we would want him to rebound and then find the point guard on the outlet. As opposed to if this rebounder, like Middleton does here, half twist on his way down, and lands with his chest and shoulders in direction to half court, then we want that player to become his own outlet. And if we have a player like Middleton who can dribble push, then all the better. So we want players to become their own, out, uh, become their own outlet because we want to eliminate a pass in transition. We can eliminate that um, outlet pass, then our transition can become that much quicker. So here we're going to see him become his own outlet, and again, we want to be ball movers early with the ball crossing half court by air. Here, Giannis receives the hit ahead. And because of the gravity that he has, he has his defender, Harris, and the help side defender, Horvath here, both loading to the ball. 
And this creates a two-on-one -on -one advantage on the two side where one defender is caught guarding the two players on the two side. And again, corner spacing is going to create this two-on-one -on -one advantage and it's going to create two separate closeouts. Now on the spray, Giannis is going to find Ilya Sova on the 45. And on his catch, because this is a short closeout, the defender is closer than arm's length distance. This becomes a small advantage that Ilya Sova turns into a drive decision. And that's, this becomes the second closeout here on the two side. Here, this closeout stunts and recovers. This is the second closeout that we are trying to drive. Here, Ilya Sova plays with zero seconds on the catch, plays paint to great, and then we get this big advantage key shot or a rim finish. The only thing that we would want Giannis to do in this situation <clears throat> is after he sprays it to the 45, is to get into space and out of space. Here he uh, just clogs up the lane and leaves Harris or gives Harris an opportunity to help on Ilya Sova's drive. So we would want Giannis to get here to the 45 to get to establish a two side on the left side. The point guard's responsibilities are we want to be a ball mover early. So we prefer hit aheads over dribbles. The, the, the outlet area, as we've already defined, is around the nail. So we're going to want the point guard to stampede his catch and catch this outlet somewhere around the nail, which our outlet area here is nail to three-point line and then free throw line extended to three-point line. On made shots, it's an important part to, to point out here. We want to get this ball out of the net without the ball dropping to the floor. And we, we're really adamant about this with our youth players in practice. Because a lot of times they let that ball bounce out of, the, um, out of the net or they dribble across the baseline to inbound the ball. So we want to get it out of the net. We want to get that one foot across the baseline as quickly as possible. And we want to outlet that ball. So the point guard here is already stamping his catch. And we want to be a ball mover early with the ball crossing half court by air. And when we do this, we are putting, even though the defense is back five on five with neutral advantage, we are creating an advantage with this drive the 45. Again, we want to drive small advantages. So on this hit ahead, we have a small advantage on the catch, or we have a small defensive bubble here. So this drive the 45 becomes a punch. We're going to play paint to great. And this penetrator is going to pass where his help came from. So the, the, the corner, and the reason why we want corner spacing is the corner is the first spot that is left open by a transition defense in rotations. Here comes the help from the corner, uh, from the player from in the corner spacing. We pass where that help came from, and we generate this big advantage catch and shoot three within the first five seconds of the shot clock. And I believe that this big advantage three is a result of our point guards being willing to be a ball mover early with the ball crossing half court by air by valuing hit aheads over dribbles. We play paint to great and pass where I hope came from. The next teaching response or the, the teaching uh, progression for our responsibilities in our two side transition or in our transition responsibilities is our corners and our 45s. So whoever is the first player down, no matter if it's a two, three, four, or five, because we're positionless, we want them to fill corners, rim level, and we want them to have width and depth. So we're focused on the first three steps of these players in transition being long and explosive. And then the next rule is we want them to find the nearest sideline. So we are telling players to fill the corners, to sprint and hug, to, to rim level. This hugging, the sprint and hug becomes a visual cue for the players to sprint as close to the sideline as possible to open up the middle third uh, for dribble penetration. So the first players down are trying to get behind the defense or they're trying to establish corner space. And we're always telling them that running creates a small advantage, sprinting creates a big advantage. The 45s, a little bit different with the 45s, they have the same roles as the corner, corners that they're focusing on the first three steps. Uh, but at the point of the rebound, 
they're going to find the nearest sideline and only sprint to half court, which is where this uh, red arrow is, is, um, is uh, being an example of. Once they get to half court, we want them to delay their fill to the 45, and we call this a delay and hug. And the reason why is we want them to be available for the point guard to hit ahead, and hopefully that hit ahead is from early and opposite. So just looking through the responsibilities of the corners, there's two responsibilities that they must have. They must get to corner spacing, or they must try to get behind the defense. So the first thing is, once, the, once we got the rebound, or once we got control of the rebound, the first thing is we want players to find the nearest sideline. So whether that's on the right side or the left side. And then we're focusing on our first three steps and transition to sprint. And anytime that the corners are sprinting and finding the nearest sideline, we call this a sprint and hug. The first players down can either get to corner spacing where this player will eventually end up rim level, or they can sprint to try to get behind the defense as we see Davinzio here. Now, uh, Davinzio is the first player down, so he's trying to get behind the defense. And as he does so, he is going to pull number 40 with him or else he would give up this layup, which is a big advantage uh, shot at the rim. Because he pulls number 40 with him, we get an early and opposite pass to Ilya Sova here at the 45, and we've just created a big advantage catch and shoot three here within the first six to eight seconds on the shot clock. So we see this five on three offensive advantage in every single game. And this is what our transition drills look like. We have a five on three offensive advantage. Again, going back to, are we teaching players how to create this advantage and leverage this advantage? And we're gonna leverage this with our two side spacing. This is a five on three numerical advantage that should always lead to a big advantage shot. So how did this big advantage shot or how is this big advantage shot created? The first players down are sprinting to corner level, corner, uh, corner spacing, or they're trying to get behind the defense. Next, we want players to find the nearest sideline at the point of the rebound and sprint and hug. And then the second one is the point guard decision making. So in our very first clip, the reason why we are going early and opposite here to the two side is because we're reading the defender who is on the single side on the same sideline, which is what we call an early and up pass. If this defender is outside the three-point line, then that is the point guard's decision to go early and opposite. And here the early and opposite pass is to, to the two side. The next example here of the corners uh, is I wanna highlight the corner spacing in both corners and how space before advantage is applied here to flatten and stretch the defensive rotations as they are getting back in defensive transition. So notice how the first players down arrive at corner spacing. So we here have the right corner, we have the left corner here, and this is gonna flatten the defense and forces rotations that lead to a shot or drive decision out of the corner. Now at the point of the rebound, all players are focused on their first three steps, sprint, and hug the nearest sideline, sprint and hug. They're going to arrive early to their corner spacing to leverage advantage before shot. And then lastly, again, why is this point guard going early and opposite? And the reason why is the uh, same side hit ahead, which is an early up pass, early and up pass, this defender is outside the three point line. So this makes our point guard the decision to go early and opposite. And in this case, it's to a two side. And again, we got that two on one advantage. With that one more to the corner, we create the second closeout by number 20. And this leads to a big advantage shot within the first six to eight seconds in transition. Now talking about the 45's uh, transition responsibilities. The misconception of in transition for us is we want all players to sprint. Yes, we want all players to sprint, but we want our 45s in particular to delay to fill the 45. That, this is something that Chris Oliver talks about in the teaching points for the 45. We want them to delay. I call it a delay and hug because we want them to play as close to the sideline 
just like the corners are when they're sprinting to fill corner spacing. So here's an example of uh, this delay and hug. Now in any numerical situation, again, we want all players to be sprinting. I want you to keep an eye on Westbrook here. Westbrook is playing, um, he's delaying to fill, he's delaying and hugging, and he almost looks disinterested here. He's, almost, he's playing parallel with Harden, and it looks like he is out of the play. But once Harden whips it to Westbrook, notice the stretch spacing between Westbrook and McLemore here in the corner. This, with this corner spacing and the 45 delaying to fill and a delay and hug, we have this two-on-one advantage. One of the rules of dominoes is we we want we don't let one de we we um, don't let one defender guard two, but we also don't want one defender to help on penetration and close me out. So in this case, we don't want this defender to help what uh, help on Westbrook's penetration, and then close out Macklemore in the corner. Here, McLemore gets a big advantage shot. So in order for us to have the role of one defender can't guard two and one defender can't help and close me out, we have to have stretch spacing between the 45 and the corner. And Westbrook does a great job, and we want all of our players who fill the 45 to put pressure on the rim with their catch. And here Westbrook does a great job of putting pressure on the rim with his punch. And he ensures that one defender can't guard two using a small advantage that leads to a big advantage shot. The next point here on our 45s with stretch spacing is an example of what it looks like to have poor spacing. So here we're gonna see the, the two side on the left side. So once PJ Tucker, and McLemore reach half court. So we see PJ Tucker and McLemore here forming the two side on the left side. We're gonna see McLemore sprint and hug the, the corner spacing. We're gonna see PJ Tucker sprint and hug to half court. But once he gets to half court, he's gonna look over his inside side shoulder and he's going to delay to fill the 45 and delay to hug. Here, Hart is gonna go early and opposite with the pass. And we're gonna notice the catch of PJ Tucker almost free throw line extended. So we would ideally want PJ Tucker or the guy who's filling the 45 to delay the fill and catch three point line extended. The reason why is because corner spacing must ensure that one defender cannot guard two. So on this one more to the corner, we don't want number eight to be able to contest this shot. And here he's contesting that shot and what we would identify as a small advantage shot. The second rule here on our corner spacing is we don't want the defender to help and close me out. So here this defender helps on PJ Tucker's catch and then he can close out the corner, uh, the corner shot. So he helps on PJ Tucker's uh, catch and then he closes out uh, McLemore in the corner. So we want to create two closeouts here. So ideally on PJ Tucker's catch, because he has uh, stretched spacing, three-point line extended, when he makes this one more to McLemore in the corner, it would force the second closeout from this player here at the block. But in this case, it doesn't because of our poor spacing, and we get this small advantage shot from the corner. The last point here with our 45s is how can a 45 create a rob shot for their teammate? This is an example of, uh, again, just players coming down to corner spacing and then a delay to fill. So our two side is up on our right side. Here we have this player going to corner spacing. We have Rivers here. He's going to delay to fill on a delay and hug. And then we have this player here going to corner spacing. Notice that um, uh, Austin Rivers is already calling for the ball as he slows down at half court. The reason being is he knows that he has stretch spacing with the player in, in the corner and one defender is caught guarding two on the two side. So now when Austin Rivers catches, his stretch spacing is going to ensure that one defender can't guard two and that this one defender, Lowry, 
cannot help and then close out the next pass. And in this case, this leads to a big advantage shot in the corner. Now, how can I create this shot for my teammate in the corner? How can I create this big advantage shot? We tell our 45s to always catch to put pressure on the rim. And here it looks like Rivers is in, in the shooting motion. And this is going to make the got to defender commit to that closeout. Now he can make that one more. And now there is no second closeout. And, th and then again, this is always a big advantage shot that we're going to shoot. So those are the responsibilities of uh, what our corners and 45s are doing within the two side. Transition priorities are the very first thing that we're doing within the two side is our transition reaction. So we're showing these things through film. So the first thing at the point of the rebound, our priority is we have to sprint and hug. So we're always coaching players to sprint. All five players got to be committed to their sprint, focusing on their first three steps, and their reaction is going to determine if we get a big advantage shot. Sprinting leads to big advantage. Jogging leads to small advantage. The very next priority in our two side is once we have outlet that ball or we've become our own outlet is we want to hit ahead early and opposite. Once we've gone early and opposite, our next priority is we want to keep the ball hot for big advantage shots. So if we have a small advantage, we must keep the ball speed hot with our passes so that we can turn small advantages into big advantages, whether that's through a get, a DHO, or a pick and roll. And we're always trying to create and find passing windows uh, so that we can play paint to great. Then the last thing is we want to find a trigger if neutral advantage. And again, we want, we're just trying to get two on the ball. So here in our teaching progressions of going early and opposite, uh, this is the very first constraint and the very first thing that we're teaching players in our two side when we get to our drills. So the first thing is they have to go early and opposite. So the reason why we want to go early and opposite is because it goes against transition defense's tendencies. And we're going to show you why and how it goes against their tendencies. And the reason why it goes against their tendencies is because it's moving transition defense twice. So here we're going to see an example of moving the transition defense twice. So here we're going to see a deep outlet to Harden. And transition defense priorities is number one, the closest player to the ball needs to stop ball. The second priority is the rim. So the, the farthest player away from the rim is always going to protect rim. Here in this case, this player usually gets caught guarding two on the two side. Here's our two side. The third priority is if you are a ball side guard, you're going to plug the ball side hit ahead or the, the advanced pass. And then our bigs are going to load up the middle third. So we, we know this when we're transitioning the two side. The first way that we move transition defense is with the outlet pass. When we go early and opposite, we move the defense twice. So now all the defenders have to adjust their, their defensive triangles. We've just moved the defensive transition twice. And now we got a two on one advantage on the two side. And we've already discussed what that looks like and why we're trying to generate that shot. The last thing that I want to point out here is number seven. Reason why we want corner spacing and the reason why we want to transition early and opposite is it moves the defense twice because we get two on ones on the two side. And notice number seven, plug the ball side hit ahead and then have to recover the entire length of the court to potentially close out that, the, the extra pass to the corner. And this is what the two side spacing template is going to give us when we go early and opposite. The next example of going early and opposite, and, I'm, and we're going through all of our teaching progressions. So the first thing would be we would want to go early and opposite by air, by a skip pass. The next teaching progression is we would go early and opposite by dribble. And we call this a drive it to move it. So here we see a deep outlet. The point guard is stampeding his catch, already getting downhill. And also we see the two side on the left side following the rules of finding the nearest sideline, sprinting and hugging. Here the point guard is going to read a four on three numerical advantage with the advantage going opposite. 
So once we uh, get to the outlet, we move the defense once, and we're going to move the defense twice by going early and opposite. Now, this drive it to move it is more uh, realistic for youth players because youth players typically don't have the uh, strength to make that skip pass on an early and opposite pass. So we do allow players to cross half court by dribble, but if they do, then we're looking to drive it to move it, preferably um, preferably uh, to the two side. Now notice how the 45 here is delaying and, delaying and hug, so delay and hug with stretch spacing between him and the 45. He catches at the three-point line extended, and now we ensure that one defender cannot guard two, and one defender cannot um, uh, help and close me out, which would be on this one more from the 45 to the corner. The next one would be when we go early and opposite to a single side. So we go in early and opposite to a two side, but because our players have to find the nearest sideline, sometimes opposite of the outlet is a single side. So here we're gonna see an outlet again, the, the point guard stampeding his catch. The two side is up the left sideline. And the reason why he's not gonna go early and up is because this defender is outside the three point line. So now he's gonna go opposite of his outlet, trying to move transition defense twice. He hits ahead to the single side. And if we catch in space, we're into our first touch decision. There's nobody to move it to. So even though we don't generate a two-on-one advantage or two closeouts, we do have an advantage where we can attack a closeout one-on-one -on -one in space, or in this case, we have a big advantage catch and shoot three in transition. The last thing here would be, what if we're dribble pushing in, uh, in transition when we're going early and opposite, which is another constraint we put into our drills. So here on the outlet, our point guard is stampeding his catch. And again, a teaching point when we go, uh, when we go, um, when we, when we dribble push is we dribble until defense has stopped us. And here the dribble push gets inside the three point line. And now he's going to go opposite of his outlet to the two side. Now notice again, the stretch spacing between the 45 and the corner and the two side does a great job of uh, stretching the got to defender. This is the player closest to the ball, but he's not the one who closes out as close as man. This player is the one that's going to close out. This becomes a big advantage on the catch, but because this closeout is long and hard, this player pump fakes, sidesteps, and creates another big advantage shot for himself here within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. The last thing here when we're talking about early and opposite it's just an example of bad spacing. So here the ball is going to go to the outlet. All right, the point guard is going to go early and opposite, the two sides on our left side. And here we have this player here already throwing his hands up to receive this hit ahead, but he needs to get to corner spacing. This is the player that should be delaying and hugging. So here he's going to stop at the 45. The pass comes, and we call this situation – where there are two players with this poor spacing holding hands. So if we, if we see two players with bad spacing, we just tell them stop holding hands so they can space before advantage. <clears throat> the last thing that we're gonna discuss here before we get into our core drills is going early and up. So the early and up goes same side as the hit ahead. We want our point guards to be ball movers early. And because we value hit aheads over dribbles, Hit aheads become coaches clap for us. So here's an example of the point guard being a ball mover early with the, the ball crossing half court by air. So here on the rebound, we get it out of the net as quickly as possible. And you can see the, the, uh, the left sideline sprinting and hugging. The ball crosses half court by air. We advance this pass. And this player is either sprinting to corner spacing or he's trying to get behind the defense. So if we're trying to get behind the defense, we just say race to space. And being a ball mover early, going early and up, has created this big advantage catch and shoot three for us within the first six to eight seconds of the shot clock. And again, earlier shots in transition for us hold more value. Here's another example of being a ball mover early. On this uh, inbound, 
Harden doesn't even put the ball on the floor, but he is going to hit ahead to the single side with the ball crossing half court by air by being a ball mover early. And then uh, Westbrook is going to go early and opposite. So this is an example, again, of trying to move transition defense twice while we're, while we're in the two-side transition. So the first way that we move transition defense is by going early and up, by being a ball mover early. And although that the defense has a four-on-four -four neutral advantage, going early and opposite, we catch them in poor rotations. We have a two-on-one -on -one advantage on the two-side. And now Macklemore catches in space. Big advantage, catch and shoot three. Mark, we're going to go ahead and get to drills here. So we're going to teach how we load these drills. We've covered a lot of what we were going to talk about uh, in less detail in the other clinic. But here, here's how we're, we're progressing through our drills. So in our drills, I've experimented with going with linear learning and nonlinear learning. So I'm going to present the drills in a linear way to where we're going from uh, a drill to B drill to C drill, where we're progressing from two on one all the way up to five on five. But what, what I'm changing is we're doing it in a nonlinear way. So we're going to start with film and we're showing transition responsibilities, what the 45s, corners, point guards, rebounder, inbounder has to do through film. And then we're getting right into four on two transition. And then from there, we start teaching the spacing, we start teaching the constraints, and then we start teaching our points of emphasis. So I'll, I'm going to come back to this drill. I'm going to do this drill last, and then we're going to get right into the four on two. So the four on two transition um, is where uh, we, we don't have teams. We just put players on the baseline. We have four players here in a wheel, and we have two players here um, somewhere in between three point line and half court. And then the second defender is at the nail. So the coach is going to throw this ball off the backboard. As the players are in their wheel, at the point of the rebound, they're going to find the closest sideline wherever they're at. If it's a three side, then we're a three side. Here in this case, we have a single side, and then we have a two side here up the right side. The point guard, wherever he's at in the wheel, is going to loop to the nail. We want him to stampede his catch. The outlet comes from the coach to the point guard, and we want to get a bust out dribble, and then we want to hit ahead with the ball crossing half court by air. The first constraint that we do is we want to go early and opposite, whether the pass is to a single side. So if the point guard uh, inbound was, uh, or was outletted to the point guard on this side, then we want to go early and opposite to the single side. If the point guard uh, was outletted to uh, on the, right, the left side here, then we're going to go early and opposite up to the left side or here on the right side here with the two side. That's our first constraint. In this four on two transition, we put eight seconds on the shot clock and then we play, try to create this big advantage shot within eight seconds on the shot clock. If there is a missed shot or if there's an offensive rebound because we are a tag up team, then the offense gets no dribbles, so they either get a put back or they get a kick out for a three, but they get no dribbles. And then they get only one extra shot attempt. So that's how we organize our four on two transition. Now our points of emphasis are all players find the nearest sideline sprints and hug. And then on the hit ahead, we're talking through our first touch decisions. And we're reading the nail defender here because we have an obvious big advantage. Our constraints are the very first practice, we go five possessions or we go, uh, um, we go for a certain time here on early and opposite. So they can only go early and opposite, whether that's to a two side or to a single side. The next constraint that we give is we only allow them to go early and up. So early and up, again, can go to a single side or it can go to a two side. But the only teaching point there is it has to go early up the same sideline. Then we're into a dribble push. So when we get into our dribble push, because we have four offensive players, we don't, uh, because there is going to be no defender here, four on two on a ball side corner, we do not allow them to 
pass to the ball side corner. So we have to, on a dribble push, we have to spray it opposite of the dribble push. And whether that's to a two side, if we do, if we spray this to a two side, we have a two on one advantage with, the, with X2. If we spray on a dribble push to a single side, then let's just say there's one player here at the 45, then we have a one-on-one -on -one advantage, small advantage, but an advantage, to where we have a one-on-one -on -one with uh, X2 in space. The last constraint that we do, we, we do it random. We're going to allow the point guard to go early and opposite, early and up, or dribble push by reading the nail defender. So if the two is uh, um, shading over to the two side, then we're gonna go early and up to the single side. If the two is shading over to the single side, then we'll go early and opposite to the two side. The last thing we do once, this is probably two or three weeks into this drill, is we add a third defender. So the third defender here, his rule is once the rebound is caught, once the coach has got the rebound, then as one is trying to create a passing window for an outlet, Player three now becomes an on-ball defender full court. So now the point guard has to make a decision on reading the nail defender X2 on where he's shading and has, he has to now make that pass under pressure with X3 here playing him full court. And then that's how we're loading the four on two, four on two transition. From there, the very next drill that we would do in practice is two on one on the two side. So here we have one on the left sideline. We have our two side on the right sideline, stretch spacing, and we have X1, one foot in, one foot out. We allow this player one dribble to make a pass outside his body. So we jump to make this pass, and we're always telling players it's okay to jump to pass. It's just not okay to jump to find the pass. So we're either going to pass to two or three based upon where X1 is at. So we're going we're going to go early and opposite to two. And on two's catch, he's reading small advantage or big advantage, closer than arm's length distance or farther than arm's length distance. Again, if it's a, a big advantage, we shoot it. If it is a small advantage, we don't allow them to drive, but we are making this one more to the corner for a big advantage catch and shoot shot. X1 is going to close out two, and then he's going to try and close out three. Uh, here as, as we make this one more pass to the corner. The next constraint that we do is now we are allowing two, that's the third decision of either to shoot it, drive it, or move it. So now two, if X1 is closer than arm's length distance, he can either make the one more to the corner or he can attack this closeout on a drive it. And now once he drives it, we're into our push and pull concept with if he penetrates left, then we're gonna pull three behind him, and then we're gonna work on playing off of two feet in the paint, stride stop, and then we're gonna uh, pass behind to the safety as the three gets behind two as he penetrates. The last uh, constraint here would be on the catch, two now has first touch decision to either shoot it, drive it, move it, or he can get into a DHO with three, and now three is reading X1, if he stays with two or if he uh, switches on to three, then we're going to whip it to two as he gets the space. After that, we get into our two-on-one shooting, which is we, we, we go through two-on-one shooting or two-on-one on the two side. It just varies on what day of the week it is. So here's the game that we play when we're on our two-on-one shooting. And the reads are the same when we're, when we're two-on-one on the two side. X1 passes to one, and again, we're first touch decision, small advantage, big advantage. We only want shots from the three-point line. So if one stays, both stay on offense. If uh, one makes the pass to two for a one more, then in two makes the shot, both stay on offense. So one, if he, if he makes the assist and two makes it, one gets a point for an assist. So we're, we, we'll, we'll score up to seven, or if we have time, we score up to 10. Now what we're doing is we're adding catch and shoot only. On the second constraint, we're going to punch the catch. So let's just say now X1 passes to two. If two has a small advantage, 
then two is going to punch the catch, create a driving line. And because we can't finish at the rim, one is going to push and relocate to create a passing window. And now he sprays to one. And now X1 is going to try and close out one. That would be the second load. The third load is either DHO a 45 catch or throw and go a corner catch. So let's say X1 throws to X1 throws to one. We now make the constraint to where he has to DHO two in the corner. And now we're working our DHO reads, whether it's clean, whether it's dirty. And then the second thing that we do is if X1 decides to throw it to two, if he doesn't like his catch for a big advantage catch and shoot shot, then he can throw it to one and get it from one. And then from here, X1 has to defend two. And now we have a two on one advantage or a trigger that we're working here on a throw and go if it's a corner catch. And again, in, when we're working the throw and go, we're just, we're gonna reject it if X1 denies it. We're gonna play cat and mouse if X1 goes under one on the throw and go. Um, and then on this rule, if X1 goes under one on the throw and go, when we play cat and mouse, X1 can only go under the defense one time. From there, we're into two on one to where we're reading this, um, this help defender on the two side. So we're gonna get penetration from a 45, and this is just one step by X1. If he stays the same, two needs to create a passing window and he needs to lift so uh, the so player one can play off of two feet in the paint and spray it to two. If X1 steps up, now we're introducing the ghost cut. We're reading the back of the head of X1. And as one is penetrating from the 45, we make this a, a ghost cut from the corner. And then we make that pass. And then we finish at the rim. The last thing that we do is, and I don't have it here, is if X1 turns and has chest to the ball handler, then two is gonna stay for corner spacing because we've just mimicked X1 helping on this penetration. So these are some of the reads that we're working on on when to lift, when to ghost cut, or when to maintain your corner spacing. And then we're into, yes. Oh. <laughs> Bags of here. So here we're going to go three on two on the next load or the next progression. And this is introducing our slingshot trigger. So a slingshot for us is two passes. So anytime we make two passes in a row, we call that a slingshot. And we're going to show that when we get to our four on three, a drill that we do four on three. So we introduce um, the slingshot here with this drill. So I, this is a drill off of basketball immersion, three on two on the two side. X2 starts with the ball. He is going to pass to three. Three is going to pass to two. Two is going to pass to one. Anytime there is two consecutive passes, we call that a slingshot. So now one has to get downhill, stampede his catch, and he has to get a, part, a piece of the paint. We have to play paint to grade. As we play paint to great, we are reading X2. So, uh, X, uh, uh, so if we punch the paint here and X2 plays a little bit up, then we're going to spray that to player three. If X2 stays down, then we can spray that to player two. But the biggest teaching point here is we want stretch spacing in between two and three. Now, going back to the drill that we just did here, two on one, we are now introducing this ghost cut. So now as we slingshot the ball back to one, as one gets downhill, he punches it and plays paint to great. He is now reading X2. If X2 steps up to take uh, player two, then three is gonna ghost cut. If X2 stays down, then two is gonna relocate for a better passing window. And then one is going to, um, to hit, hit the uh, player on a pull motion as two pulls behind one for a catch and shoot shot. When we are three on two, we should always find a big advantage shot when we have numerical ad advantage. And then the last thing that we do here is when we make this lean shot from three to two, two to one, and one is getting downhill playing paint to great, we can manipulate the help side defender by 45 cut 
and the three lifting. So if X2 takes this 45 cut, then three has just created a passing window for a punch and spray. If two stays with three, then this 45 cut is wide open for one to hit this 45 cut as two is cut to the rim for a big advantage shot at the, at the rim. This is our bullets three on three. Uh, we're just working on uh, trying to work the two on one advantage and as well as one defender can't guard two and one defender can't help and close me out. So we start this player um, at half court and we start the defender at the elbow. So X1 is gonna throw that ball to one and then is going to uh, come out and close out one. One has the advantage of space and speed as one is coming out to attack him uh, defensively. So now here one uses a change of direction to punch it and we're now playing paint to great. So we're trying to force this rotation. And again, we wanna pass where the help came from because in rotating defense, the corner is the first spot that's left open by rotating defenses. As we punch and spray, we're reading the chest of X2 and we're reading X3 as he drops. If X3 doesn't drop, then our spray will go to the corner. If X3 drops here, then the spray will go to player three. If there's middle penetration and X3 helps across, then we're just making a, uh, a one more pass to three. And then now we have the two on one advantage with X2. And again, we, want, we don't want it to where one defender can guard two. And we want our spacing to ensure that as X2 uh, closes out three and the one more goes to two, X2 cannot help and then close two out. The last thing that we do here is we use the same constraints when we go into our two-on-one shooting that if the ball is sprayed to two, then we throw and go with three. If the ball is sprayed to three, then we DHO with two. And these are some of the triggers that we play out of the two side if we do not get a big advantage catch and shoot shot. The last thing that I'll say here is the moment that the point guard gets into the paint, he has got to get into the space and out of space. So we say punch, spray, space. And the reason why is if one stays here and three catches and chooses his first touch decision to drive it, one is clogging up the lane with himself and his defender. So we want to get into the space, spray it, and then get out of the space. And then from there, three has a first touch decision to shoot it, drive it, move it. Here is our four on three overlap drill. So we're talking about the slingshot trigger. Here we have a four on three offensive advantage. The coach or another player is going to enter this ball into player one. Our slingshot is we want to make two consecutive passes. So when we make two consecutive passes here, we now have a two-on-one advantage with X3. And anytime we have two-on-one advantage, we have one more, we have first touch decisions of shoot it to drive it, move it. The second, or the second constraint that we're gonna put here is when the coach passes to, to player one here, we're going to force a 45 cut by four, and we're gonna read X3. So we've just created this double gap for one to penetrate through. If X3 is, or if, four influ or if four influences X3, then three will be open on the lift and it's just created a passing window. If three doesn't go with four and stays with three, then this 45 cut has just uh, created to a, um, uh, uh, just a give and go situation for a, a big advantage shot at the rim. Now we get into four on four. So we're teaching a slingshot trigger. We're, asleep, we're teaching how to create a double gap with a 45 cut. And then we get into four on four and now it's the player's decisions. Three can either create the slingshot to four or three can 45 cut. The next thing that we're doing is the constraint of a boomerang. So now we're making that pass to one and then we're going to boomerang the same side or one pass away 
um, on the same side. And the reason why is because if we boomerang three here, because we have a two on one, it wouldn't make sense for three to pass back to one because he just slingshot at the four. So the constraint that we do here is when we, when we work our boomerang, we make this pass and pass back to the side that does not have the two on one advantage. Now, when he receives this pass back, we have to stampede that catch. So now we have a one on one advantage with one, and now we're reading X3. We should have a three on one advantage, or if at, at the very least, we have a three on two advantage with that boomerang. The next thing that we're working on is a DHO. So as the ball is passed into one, one can either DHO three or he can DHO two. And from there, we just work the trigger of getting two on the ball with a DHO. And now we're four on four and one either has the option to DHO three and two, or he can boomerang two to create that trigger um, to get that advantage of two on the ball. Once we've gone through there, now we're into our four on two double chaser, uh, double chaser drill. This is a similar thing to four, the four on two drill, but this is a drill I stole from a coach here on Guam, Reggie Guerrero, uh, the four on two double chaser. So here is the setup for the four on two double chaser. We have three teams and we have a, we have a max of four uh, or a, a minimum of four players on each team. So here we have uh, the four players on uh, blue are on offense. And the rule is the two defenders, the double chasers, cannot come into the play until the ball is crossed half court by air or by dribble. Once the ball has crossed half court by air, here it goes early and opposite to three, then the two players can enter into the play. So we, ha we have a momentarily numerical advantage to where we're trying to create a big advantage shot but that big advantage is now constricted to where it could be a small advantage or to where now defense has neutral advantage. So we're trying to get that big advantage shot early. If three cannot get a big advantage, then we're into our triggers of a slingshot, create a double gap with a 45 cut, a DHO or a boomerang. Now we play make it, take it. We play two or three rounds of four minutes and we keep score. And then our points of emphasis are what, we're, what we've been emphasizing the whole time. Find the nearest sideline, sprint and hug, delay and hug, be a ball mover early, hit it heads over dribbles, and then our first touch decisions. Now, when we transition here on the rebound, we're finding the closest sideline. We have two players from the third team waiting at the nail and waiting at the top of the key three-point line. And now we're into our transition, our transition responsibilities. Find the nearest sideline, uh, sprint and hug, delay and fill. And then from here, the red team is attacking the green team four on two momentarily until the ball crosses half court by error dribble. And then the extra two defenders come into play. The very last drill is our spacing, uh, our spacing scenarios, five on four first and then five on five. And this is the drill that we do every drill we do every single day. And we're not only working on creating big advantages, but what happens if we have five on five back and we're trying to create a neutral advantage. So we, we vary this drill throughout the, the year. First part of the year, we're working here at, uh, at the, on the baseline because we're really trying to work our transition reaction. When we're a week or two out from our first game, we move it to the free throw line extended on the opposite side. And then when we're in season, we, we start this drill at half court. So we start with one defender at half court and three players um, on the baseline. The moment that the ball is tossed into one of the players in line here, uh, the three defenders can engage into, uh, into defense and X1 can start picking up the ball. So the rules here are the ball has to change hands. So here the ball goes to five. He, we have to find our one because we have a primary point guard. And then we have to stay with our spacing. So two and four here are gonna, going to um, form a two side and three is going to form the single side. So now we're working constraints. We constrain them to where they can only go early and opposite or only early and up. 
and then they have to form a three side or we constrain it to where the point guard has to push. But what we do here is we, we make them play five straight possessions and each possession that they go back to the starting point, they can't run the same lane. So that would be some of the randomness that we apply to when we're working our two side transition. We do have a primary point guard. So they have five seconds to get back to start and then we give them a talking task. They have to say that they're either uh, on the sideline or they're either in a slot, the point guard. We give them a talking task to say, and then we're working through all of our constraints. So uh, the last thing that we do here is we would go early with the trail. I'm gonna skip ahead here to this one. So if we're working against neutral advantage five on five, and we don't have an uh, early and up, or we don't have an early and opposite, then we're working with our trail. So for instance, let's just say five finds one, we're into a uh, dribble push, then we're working our spacing scenarios if we are using a trigger. Same thing would be if one is gonna DHO three here, or if one wants to slingshot through five to four. And so we're working those, sling, uh, those uh, spacing scenarios here in our five on five and then in our five on four. Um, so th this is really basically the core drills that we're using for the two side. Um, and from here, obviously we supplement drills. Uh, we, we, uh, we start at different spots on the floor with these drills, and then we're loading them in different ways with different constraints. And I know you're all familiar with those type of constraints and, and, and variations in the loads. So that would be, that would be it to how or what our core drills would be when we are teaching and loading the two side. Um, Brent, I do have one question in the chat for you. Are you there, Brent? Yes. Okay. If the defense knows where the pass is going to on the constraints, what prevents them from stealing it? Great question. And it's because I skipped the dribble push uh, section in the presentation, but that's a great, it's a great question. Let me, let me re get back here. Drill or game, it's the same thing. The reason why we dribble push is because uh, defense knows that we're trying to hit ahead or defense is buddy running. So later on in the season, we get scouted. They know we're trying to, to advance the ball by pass. And so they, they start plugging passing lanes, whether that's early enough and early and opposite. And so we encourage now when the point guard reads that there is no hit ahead, either early and opposite or early and up, then we encourage him to dribble push. This is what it looks like to dribble push. So transition defense, if, if we cannot hit ahead because of buddy running. So here we see this player outside the three point line. So we would not wanna go early and up here. This player here who is on the two side is buddy running with his man here. So therefore we can't go early and opposite. He has no options to hit ahead. So now that point guard read would be to dribble push. And again, we dribble push until we are stopped. This is a small advantage. But when we dribble push because teams plug those hit aheads, we turn this, um, we turn this small advantage into a big advantage shot. And then from there, we can finish at the rim with a big advantage shot. If we don't have a dribble push that gets us to the uh, gets us to play in paint to great, then this is where we will be playing with a trail. So the player who's back here coming back into the play, he's trailing with pace. Then we would trigger something here with the ball, and we would we would make the we'd, we we want the point guard to keep that ball in his hands to work that next trigger. Okay, Coach Sloan, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thank you for this. I've been wanting to do the two sided. Uh, uh, transition for a long time now. Um, this 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 year, I have uh, kind of the personnel to have a lot of kids that can um, really push the ball up the floor. Um, do you think you could uh, utilize this with kind of the 
the pusher runner concept that kind of Dayton does where, um, you know, you label kids as um, making their own outlet or being their own outlet versus a guy that can't push and um, has to make that outlet pass. Like, do you think like, say I have four guards that can really push. Do you think I could just have um, kids that um, can push the ball, just be their own outlet? Um, like, do you, do you think that would be effective, I guess? Right. That's a really great question. Um, the more players that can become their own outlet, the quicker your transition pace is going to be. And the reason is because you're eliminating a pass in transition. The only thing that I would say is we have a primary point guard because we, we only have one guy who we're comfortable with making that decision. But if you got guys who can do that, I, the only thing I would suggest would be put that into your constraints early. So if you know that you're going to be a team that becomes their own outlet often, put it into your constraints. And for us, a dribble push won't be a, a constraint that we use often. We do use it. But for you, instead of working maybe the early and opposite constraint, you're working more of a dribble push constraint. The only thing that, I, that we've had problem with when we've experimented with that is we, we, if we don't dribble push, we have three or two players always coming back to the ball, and now we don't have options to get to corner spacing as quickly. So that would be the only thing that we've experimented with that we have not done well then is if we had allowed more than one or two players to become their own outlet, then we don't have people getting the corner spacing. And so I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but that's basically how my mind would interpret that. No, that, that's perfect. Thank you, Coach. Um, this is a really good question because the high school coaches get probably pressed more than the NBA and probably even more than national teams do. So how do you adjust the two-sided break if they run a three-quarter or a half-court press? Really good question. I wish I had film. And again, Mark, I debated on that one. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. I'm going to see if I can pull up something that, yeah, let me just pull this one up. This has nothing to do with that question. But I think I want to give you a visual of what we're doing on the court here. So um, let's just say uh, that they're they're in the three quarter court here. Just a, let's just say it's a a two a two two one. So we're telling the reason why we want our forty fives to delay and hug is for this very reason. So if you can imagine, let me play this for just a little bit. If you can imagine, they're in the just a two two one. We would want our 45 somewhere about here and our corner spacing somewhere around free throw line extended. If we're on the single side, we don't want single side getting up the corner spacing. We would want the corners of uh, the uh, single side playing somewhere in between uh, the free throw line extended and half court. So if we go early and up, now we can drive the 45. If we go early and opposite, the bottom of their 2 2 1 here has to be drawn up to the pass that goes to the 45. So now the 45, if we go early and opposite, can make the one more where well, you can't see it, but to the to the player who is at their free throw line extended, who is supposed to be in corner spacing. So I guess the the the, the quick answer to that is we, we tell our players don't disappear from the ball. We want them coming back to the ball maintain their space but really delay to fill those 45s so we don't put somebody in the middle because uh the the for for me the, the way i see any the way i see any uh three-quarter court press even though it's a two 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 a two two one in the middle supposed to be open or theoretically we feel that if we make quick passes early and opposite to the, to the 45 who's delayed and the delay of the 45 can beat that rotation up the sideline to whoever is corner spacing but has come up to the 45, we can beat that 2-2-1 and we can beat that trap. And uh, that's just how we do it. We've experimented with it different ways, but the past year, that's how we have been breaking uh, uh, th three-quarter court presses with the two-side transition because we don't really want to have a press break. We just want to make sure there's fluidity in our transition. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, coach, a um, couple rib runner questions here. 
Is rim runner by design? I'm going to ask that because my knowledge of two sided should be in a five out, but on a lot of your clips, you saw I saw a, a player rim running. Right. So yes, rim run. Uh, it it can be either or. So rim runner can, depending on what you what you what your desires are, they can either empty out to the ball side short corner or the weak side short corner. Um, let me pull this clip up here. I didn't get to this clip, uh, but I think it will help answer our question here. Here, this is this is Houston Rockets two side transition, and they have a rim run. So this is actually an example of bad improper rim, um, rim running. This is a rim runner here. So if we are rim running, and actually if you watch uh, Auburn do it, they have a rim runner almost every possession. We would want this player to rim run and get uh, Kimball Walker here on the front rim. So we would want him to split and sit this guy, get a deep seal above the smile. And when he does that, or theoretically, if he does that, let's just envision him splitting and sitting Kimball Walker here. We have now, if we go early and opposite, we now have a two-on-one on the two side. If he gets to Kimball Walker, splits and sits him, and gets front rim. So yeah, you can use a, uh, a rim runner. How you empty a rim runner is, is varied upon, is he a shooter or a non-shooter? So shooter is if we rim run, we would just empty him to the corner. If he's a non-shooter, then we would empty him either to short corner ball side or short corner weak side. Um, Chad and Chaz, can you... Right. Yes. If he answered that question for you guys, I think he did. So just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He answered it. That was awesome. Okay. Thank you guys. Thanks. Um, we got a coach uh, question from coach Holmes here. It says, when you get to the three side, Brent, are you always pushing the 45 through or do you just keep the three side and use a drag on the empty side? Or is that just a decision? Great. That's a great question. Um, I've always cut the 45, but we had a project with Basketball Australia two months ago, and it was all on empty, empty corner pick and rolls. So I'm going to adjust that philosophy. So we're always cutting the 45. Um, and so we have originally cut the 45, uh, but the teaching point here is wait till you get to the 45 to cut. And the reason why is if this player, this player right here is the is on a three side. He's the middle player on a three side. So we have a player in the corner, and then we have a player here who's in the field of 45. We want to wait till we get to the 45 to cut. And here is three-point line extended. And the reason why is if we cut the three side here at half court, we are plugging the middle third for the ball handler's penetration, potential dribble, dribble push. So we wait till we get to the 45. Here in this case, we're going to empty out to the single side corner, and then here it's just a here's just a uh, um, playing early with the trail, early in drag, uh, and this is just a trigger that we use. We get a, we get a um, tag from the low man on the two side that just creates a big advantage shot in the corner. So to answer your question, we cut the 45, but what I am going to um, experiment with, and I haven't done it, is I'll keep this player on the 45. This player will come to the slot, and in FIBA our spacing will be a little bit different. We will get this player below the free throw line extended on a dribble push. And then we're going to have this guy come in and smash uh, the on ball or yeah, the, the ball carriers defender. And the teaching point for the empty corner pick and roll is get below the three point line. And when you use this uh, empty corner pick and roll, we want to stay within the elbows on our penetration as we punch and spray or as we play paint to grade. Uh, Jason has an issue with this trailer. So for some reason, my trail guy is jamming up my two-sided break. We were getting outlets on the sideline, which might solve the problem. But what should we do if my trail is getting into my point guard's penetration action? We had the same exact problem. We, we, we stopped practice so much for that. Because players, if they don't come from your program, they're pre- pre-programmed to sprint because coaches are yelling at them to sprint and as i said earlier yes we want them to sprint but we only want corners to sprint the corner spacing we want the 45 to sprint to half court but then we want him to really delay 
with our trailer. Let me see if I can pull up a clip here. Uh, let me go to the first clip here. With our trailer, we say de uh, um, uh, delay the trail. So we want the trailer to play with pace. So here is just an example of that. We ideally would want him a little bit farther back, but we have a lot of times this player wants to get up and beat the ball down. So he'll be somewhere around here. Now we brought this defender into the action uh, and the, the ball carrier has no options. He cannot go early and opposite. He can't really get on a driving line. So we say delay the fill and we're constantly coaching trail with pace. So here's just an example of our trigger of a uh, going early with the trail on an early and drag. And it just makes it for uh, when we do trail with pace, we're just reading the point guard because some of our triggers are if we don't trail with pace, some of our triggers are we may DHO the um, DHO the single side and then from there get into a ball screen or we may DHO into the single side and the pay, the trailer may play in space farther from the from the rim to where now we're given a driving line for the DHO to get on a driving line. So if we don't trail with pace, we don't have the option. So we ideally really want him to play behind the ball as much as possible, never parallel, but always behind that ball carrier so we have that space. Let's see here. Do, do, do. That's it. Um, do you ever trigger one to, f one to trail and then just play single downs and dribble handoffs or? Or is that so one of, yeah, one of the triggers that we haven't done, but you know, over the lockdown, we're still on lockdown. Two triggers that we're gonna add into all this besides DHOs and all that is we're gonna go pistols on it early and up. So if we don't have a hit ahead or if we don't have a dribble push early and opposite, if we can't drive the 45 on it early and up, we're gonna get the pistols. And then the next trigger that we're gonna use is going early through the trail by delay. So we'll just hit the hit the trail. We'll get a down screen on this side, a down screen on this side. And that's some of the things I've, uh, it's just kind of watching film on that we're gonna introduce to next, when we get them back, uh, when we're triggering, if we don't have advantage early on in the two side. What year was the army film? Was that 2017, 18? 2019. 2019, okay. That was last season. Because it said Zion, so Zion was the year before. So 2018 then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought I saw Zion's name, but I may be wrong. Yeah, I, I was either 2018 or 2019. Okay. Gotcha. Any other questions for him, guys? Did a really good job again. Looking through my chat here, don't see anything. Okay. Right. Well, if you guys are unsure, if you click the little check mark when you signed up, my email is right there on the screen, Coach Mark Hart at Gmail. Send me an email. Do not put it in chat because as soon as this zooms over, I will not look at that probably chat transcript to get everybody. So um, I'll be sending out once coach sends it over to me. All I have to do is attach it and send it out and it goes to everybody that registered real fast. So So that's what I have. Do, 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 view. Okay. Making sure there's no hands up. Oh, let's see, chat. Great stuff. Great drills. Okay. Yep. Well, again, thanks again there, um, Brent. It was awesome as usual. Are you on mute? Can't hear you. No, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. You just catching up, finally taking a breath? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> he's the only he's the only guy I know that does a clinic where he does it like an hour or whatever and he doesn't ever takes a breath. It's like amazing. 
<laughs> so great stuff. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate, you know, just helping us coaches get better. Um, just being a resource for us because there's not a lot of coaches that do that to be a resource and with the, with the intention to help and your heart behind it's very evident. I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing for us coaches. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Um, as soon as coach gets it over to me, guys, I'll get it out to you guys. So it might, might take a while. I mean, he has a lot of video on there, so he probably has to upload it to, uh, then I got to figure out how I get it out to you guys through a Google drive or whatever. So it's not a small file. I know that. So it might take, might take a day or so. So just be patient, but it will get to you guys. You guys have a great night and check out the um, emails and stuff. Sunday night, we will be having another clinic and that is system oriented. So if you're interested in system basketball, Sunday night, I have Aaron Levin of Grinnell College. Um, if you're gonna learn it from somebody, probably need to learn it from the innovators of the Grinnell system. He's coming to discuss why the system. So he's gonna do a little philosophy to kind of tell you guys why you might wanna take a peek at running the system. So he's, he's, a, he's a great guy too. So that's what I have for you guys Sunday. And then I got some stuff in the future. I got some high post spread ops options. Next week I'm doing more than likely I'm doing five out dribble drive. So um, I haven't decided exactly what I'm doing. Either that or I'm gonna do my two, three half court trapping system. I haven't decided which one I'm doing. So, but that's what we got coming up. Um, if you guys need anything, hit my email. And if not, stay safe out there, stay and stay healthy. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you guys. Thanks, hey, thank Mark. You. Thank you. And Coach Tipton, you're a stud, man. Good, great <laughs> job, buddy. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Appreciate that. Thank you. Have a great weekend.